This is CBC Here and Now. This is the 24th edition of the Festival of Trees, an important cancer fundraiser for people in our province, especially patients who have nowhere to stay when they come to St. John's for treatments. Stay tuned. The uh, security tapes at the penitentiary would be extremely important. Uh, we are satisfied that there's no concern to any inmates or staff at HMP. The death of an inmate at HMP has been ruled a homicide and some correctional officers have been suspended as the investigation into the death ramps up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. As you just saw, Anthony is on location tonight. We'll check back with him a little later. And earlier today, he put together some analysis of what went on at the rooms. But first, our top story. There are more questions than answers after an inmate died last month inside Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Tonight, the Justice Minister isn't saying much, but CBC News has learned that several guards have been suspended. It comes as the medical examiner has determined the death of 33-year-old Jonathan Henook was a homicide. Here now's Ariana Kellant explains. It was a miserable day outside the penitentiary today. Safe to say it was miserable inside too. Jonathan Henoke's lawyer didn't want the justice minister to publicly comment on this new revelation that the Labrador man's cause of death was homicide. And in a way, his request was granted. Uh, what I can say is that this will be an extremely frustrating press conference in the sense that there's very little uh, that I can say. CBC News has learned about a handful of correctional officers have been suspended in relation to the death. Parsons says he can't say if they're still working. What's the difference with a police officer if they're accused of wrongdoing? They say, okay, this person is not working, they're off with paid leave, not paid leave. What's the difference here? Well, the reality is that the RNC make their decisions. They, uh, they don't take operational or communications advice from us. They make these decisions and they can do as they see fit. The reality is that within government, it is our policy, especially as the Attorney General, uh, not to comment on an ongoing investigation. The union representing these officers, NAEP, is also not talking today. Sources have told CBC News this, that two correctional officers went into Jonathan Hinoak's cell on Unit 2B at lunchtime, that there was some sort of altercation, and Jonathan Hinoak and another person exchanged punches. Backup was called, and Hinoak was taken down the range in an elevator and into segregation. He was beaten, although the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner has not determined his manner of death, or they haven't released it. The findings with respect to those injuries and how the medical examiner describes them are important to any investigation and will be important to the police, in my opinion. And that autopsy report would be, would be uh, very important. Uh, as well, the uh, security tapes at the penitentiary would be extremely important. I mean, you can't go anywhere, for the most part, in that institution without being under surveillance. For Jonathan Henoke's family, they've lost a loved one. He leaves behind two children. For the family of Regula Shuley, the woman Hinoke is alleged to have killed, they've lost the chance for answers. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, to the legislature now, where Christopher Mitchell Moore is finally speaking after days of silence about the Carla Foote hiring controversy. The Liberal cabinet minister stood in the House of Assembly just a few hours ago and briefly addressed the independent report that found he breached his parliamentary privilege by giving the Liberal staffer a high paying job at the rooms. It did not direct me in this matter, and I signed the request for staffing action, and my testimony is in the report that is put before the House of Assembly, and the recommendation is a reprimand by the Commissioner of Legislative Standards, who is an officer, statutory officer of the House of Assembly. Thank you. The Honorable the Leader of the Official Opposition. With due respect, the Minister did not answer the question. Did someone speaking for the Premier or purporting to speak for the Premier give him that direction? I encourage the member to read the report that is put before the House here today. Thank you. So who did direct Mitchell Moore to hire Carla Foote at the rooms? Here and now's Peter Cowan is live at Confederation Building tonight. But before we get to whose idea it was, what's happening there right now, Peter? 
Carolyn, they literally just took a break here in the legislature, in part because there's a tree lighting outside, uh, but in part because they're dealing with amendments. And so we've known that the Liberals want an apology, and about an hour ago, the PCs moved an amendment. They want a whole lot more. They're actually asking for Mitchell Moore to be suspended for two full weeks from the House of Assembly. That would be without pay. He'd have to apologize to the House and to the Board of the Rooms. And interestingly, they also want him to pay restitution, an entire year's salary, and that's to make up for the fact that the rooms has been paying Carla Foote a lot more than they were paying the position earlier. Uh, they're busy debating that. We're going to have to see how that goes. And even though if they're able to reach an agreement and actually pass something and this all wraps up this evening, that question still remains about whose idea was this. And we've heard lots of concerns that maybe this was the premier who directed it. And today he was unequivocal. Not only was it not him, but it was no one from his office. Felt that you know Carla would have been a good fit there, but no direction was actually given by me or or staff to damn the torpedoes, put Carla Foot down at the rooms. That is not what happened here. All of this is facilitated uh, with cabinet secretariat working with the deputy minister and so on. That process is outlined in the in the report. Now, that's talking about the mechanics, the people who would have done the paperwork, but it still doesn't explain whose idea it was to move her from one of the top jobs in government, she was in charge of all the communications people in all the departments, to a position at the rooms with a lot less responsibility. We haven't heard anything from Foot for, from herself, for example, to indicate that this move might have been uh, something that she wanted to do. But Interestingly, the opposition leader isn't buying the story from the premier. He says this just doesn't add up. And in fact, he pretty much said today that he thinks the premier's lying. The majority of the public thinks an order was given from the premier's office to Mitchell Moore to do these extraordinary things. So do you think Mitchell Moore is the fall guy here? Uh, yes, I think the deal is between the premier and Mitchell Moore that the premier will keep Mitchell Moore in the cabinet if Mitchell Moore keeps his silence about what really happened. Now this is supposed to be the last day that the House sits before they not only break for Christmas, but break until the beginning of March. Uh, we have heard some rumors that they may be able to reach some sort of agreement and actually resolve this this evening. Uh, if not, they could continue sitting until next week. Reporting live from the House of Assembly, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Much of the attention in the Mitchell Moore foot affair has focused on the controversy politically, but the Mitchell Moore report also puts the rooms under the spotlight. Well, by now, we all know that Chris Mitchell Moore gave the executive director of marketing job to Carla Foote without a competition, and the scheme required a $27,000 pay raise so that Foote wouldn't suffer a pay cut. The report says the pay increase worried the rooms chair of the board, Margaret Allen. But the report says the executive committee felt there was little they could do given that the premier had made the offer to Ms. Foote. Now, premier Ball denies that. Back to the chair. The report says she argued that if Carla Foote was getting a raise, then so should Ann Chafe. Chafe was the director of museums and galleries at the time. But Chafe and Foote have different credentials. In what's called a rationale for staffing, the reasons for hiring Chafe are spelled out and they're signed by the minister. But on Foote's rationale for staffing, no reasons. It's blank, but also signed by the minister. Both women got pay increases, meaning this entire staffing maneuver increased the yearly cost at the rooms by about $50,000. All this as the province's finances are in trouble. Mr. Speaker, in his report of June 11, 2019, the citizens' representative stated it again on pages 31-32, the net effect is that the rooms are overcompensating for the position of executive director of marketing and development in the range of 30 to 40,000 per year. Reasonable people would expect the Minister of the Crown to exact strict scrutiny to a request for additional salary expenditures. I asked the Minister of Finance, who has been working to reduce expenditures, how can he accept the gross mismanagement of public funds by his cabinet colleague? The Honourable the Minister of Finance, President of Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I take the role of Finance Minister very seriously. We are looking at finding efficiencies in government, Mr. Speaker. I've heard member after member after member today ask how we can sit in a caucus with somebody who has grossly mismanaged funds 
I'd ask members on the other side how they can, because the funds of this province were grossly mismanaged, Mr. Speaker, under the previous administration. When you look at things like Muskrat Falls, Mr. Speaker, when you look at a, a deficit of $1 billion in budget 2015, actually ballooned to more than double that, Mr. Speaker. So I'd ask the same question. The Honourable the Member for Stephen Port Port. Mr. Speaker, I don't know when a defense of an action became something along the lines that because they did it, we can do it too. I'm not sure that that's sound defense. sun finally came out for some of us through central and parts of eastern Newfoundland today. Uh, we did see some snow though before we saw that sunshine and uh, we're going to continue to see that snow as we head through the night tonight as that low continues to pull away and we get into that onshore setup there. So onshore flurries the story tonight along the west coast and then parts of southeastern Labrador as well. This will continue as we head through the day tomorrow. I'll tell you how much snow is on the way and what to look forward to for the next couple of days coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, an old Christmas tradition is going modern. The Salvation Army is testing debit donations at a few of its Christmas kettle sites. And as Here and Now Cease Hair reports, it's not just about getting with the times. It could make the annual fundraising campaign more successful. A lot of people say they can't make a donation because they don't have any cash on them. Well, that has changed at this kettle at the Avalon Mall. In and around the St. John's area, you will find 15 Christmas kettles, but one has gotten an upgrade. No cash, no problem. You can use your debit card, and it's a growing trend nationwide. Debit cards were tested at three sites in Happy Valley Goose Bay last year, and they brought in between three and $4,000. That makes the digital option worth investigating here. That's an average of more than $1,000 per location. And uh, if that were so, uh, you know, that, that would make it quite significant. As you can do the math for, for St. John's area, right, if it translates even in, into that uh, kind of result. And those new dollars are important because all money raised stays in the community to feed, clothe, and house people in need. Loveless says this new twist on an old tradition is about keeping up because people just don't carry cash like they used to. Enter the amount that you want to... Um, donate and then we just push that green button uh, after you've entered your your pin and it prints out your receipt debit donations are also being tested this month in marystown and bay roberts and whether this becomes the new norm depends on how often they're used one concern is making sure volunteers are comfortable with the technology we don't anticipate that it's going to be problematic that way uh, but until people get used to it, as you can appreciate, there's a little bit of apprehension uh, when, when it comes new. to the, that's new, something new. But if dropping cash into a Salvation Army kettle is part of your annual Christmas tradition, not to worry, Loveless says, that will stay the same. The digital option simply provides another way to give. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. Now for the latest on the labor tensions between Unifor and this province's Dominion stores. Union members are speaking out. They're calling for more full-time jobs, better working conditions, and better pay. If that doesn't change, they could be out on the picket line come the new year. Here and now's Adam Walsh has the details. Raylene Call is getting ready for the holidays, but a possible strike in the new year is on her mind. There isn't very much more to give. I mean, I'm pretty well, you know, worn out and it's just so frustrating. Call has worked at Dominion for more than 30 years now, but says things went downhill in the fall. Cuts to dozens of full-time jobs at this province's 11 Dominion stores increased workloads for people like Call, who says she's also concerned about her colleagues who lost their full-time positions. They can't pay their cell phone bill. They, you know, they're struggling to buy groceries. You know, they're struggling to pay the rent because rent is so high. Part-time employee and student Hugh Alcock says he too is worried about his co-workers. He says they work hard for what they earn, but for many, it's not enough. I also know people at work at Dominion that can't afford to buy what they sell. For Alcock, Dominion was almost like a family business. Over the years, his mom, brother and sister also worked there. 
but Alcock says he doesn't see climbing the corporate ladder there anymore. Plain and simple, he doesn't like what he's seeing. A business as powerful as Dominion as well should be able to take care of their employees. Unifor says it's concerned more full-time jobs could be cut in the coming year. It says it's trying to address that issue along with pay issues at the negotiating table. But when it comes to negotiations, the union says it will be January the 8th at the earliest before both sides and a government mediator can sit down. Meanwhile, a request for comment from Loblaw went unanswered. Adam Walsh, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a lifelong hunter is calling on the provincial government to legalize crossbow hunting. It's banned right now, but Jeff Sampson says the weapon is easy to use, effective, and could make the sport more appealing to young people. Here now is Garrett Berry has that story. A 230-pound draw, and it shoots arrows at 340 feet per second. The Excalibur G340. For $700. It's quite a nice little package. But buyer beware. Right now, you can only use the weapon for this. Target practice. He wants that changed. If crossbow hunting is legal everywhere else in Canada besides Newfoundland and the Yukon, well, it should be here too. This is called a compound bow. This is the type that's legal in this province for hunting. And it's actually quite difficult to draw back. Part of Samson's pitch is that a crossbow would be a lot easier for beginners. Yep. So naturally, I gave it a try. I'll say you're pretty good for the, for the first time trying today. <laughs> Point made. With a crossbow, uh, just anyone that got an interest can pick up uh, using that in a matter of probably half an hour, an hour. Why? The design means the shooter doesn't have to hold back the bow with their hand. There's a trigger for that. And you can find tools to make the loading even easier. Anybody that got any, any physical limitations or whatever, like, like uh, strength wise or whatever, like they, they haven't got to hold back any weight or anything. With so much in favor, why was it even banned? Before in the 1940s, I believe, 1949, the crossbows of the day did not have sufficient power, effective knockdown power, to effectively harvest a big game animal. That law could be changing. The provincial government is promising a review and public consultations. Sampson says legalizing the weapon could bring people back into the sport. Well, the average age on is now going down every year. Like, like it's going up every year. Uh, basically, like there's not many young people getting into hunting. He's a lifelong hunter, and he's petitioned the provincial government for this change. So, so when consultations open up, expect to hear his voice again. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Sandringham. Now, where do you put the star or the angel on an upside down Christmas tree? I have not got a clue, but I do know the Festival of the Trees fundraiser for cancer patients in this province. It's a big one. Some details about that coming up.
Welcome back, everyone, and welcome back, Ashley. Thank so you. glad you're back doing the weather. Yeah, I brought some sunshine with me too today. Yeah, it was great today. <laughs> Not too bad after that pile of rain, for yeah. sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but before we uh, get to that weather that uh, we want to talk about, we have a fun video to share with you from the RNC's Twitter account. Yeah, now normally police are clocking speeders on the roads, but this week they turned the radar on some of their own. Have a look at this. Yeah, first they used the radar to clock Castle and Constable Coombs with the RNC's mounted unit uh, to see how fast the horse can run. And it looks like it was around 42 kilometers per hour. And then, a little bit of competition, they tested Avalon from the canine unit. Uh, they used a handheld uh, radar with that. And uh, you can see Avalon uh, zooming by at a top speed of 49 kilometers an hour. Not bad. Good luck to anyone who tries to uh, outrun Avalon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be able to, that's for sure. <laughs> it's a bit of fun. I mean, yeah. it's, it's difficult to compare the, the dog and the horse because there were all these different factors going on there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's cool to see. Awesome. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, we had a pile of rain and then a load of sunshine. That's right. <laughs> Here, but through parts of Central, that was snow. So mm -hmm. I have a pretty cute picture to share with you. Take a look at that. Now take Aww. a look at closer. So we've got a beagle there and we've got a snowman. It's a lot of snow. Yeah, but... Oh, <laughs> Lucy apparently <laughs> likes carrots. You're uh, literally dangling a carrot in front of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally, yes. Yeah. So finally uh, saw some snow apparently uh, fell very quickly this afternoon, about 15 centimeters of snow. So perfect snow for a snowman. But uh, yeah, if we take a look at those temperatures across the island, you can see uh, in the one to two degree range, which is why we saw snow and 10 degrees was the daytime high for uh, St. John's and then we did see uh, some sunshine. Sun did peak out as well this afternoon through parts of Central as well and you can see that. The snow now has tapered to mainly the west coast and we're gonna see that continue. We do have some breaks in the clouds but it will stay unsettled as we head through the night tonight under the influence of that low pressure system that is offshore now. But as uh, we get into a little bit of an onshore flow, we'll start to see some periods of snow, potentially heavy at times, likely a trace to maybe five centimeters of snow by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And we're going to see that for south uh, eastern portions of Labrador as well. And that will continue into the early morning hours. So temperatures tonight going to uh, drop below zero uh, along the west coast. We're looking at uh, about minus one for Cornerbrook. Port of Bass sitting at the zero degree mark. Partly cloudy skies can't rule out the chance of either a few flurries or some showers uh, overnight either. But then one degree should be the uh, overnight low for St. John's and the wind should ease as well. Not for long though. Tomorrow those winds are going to pick right back up again. Uh, minus 11 for Lab City tonight with that potential for some flurries and Nain looking at minus six. So as we head through the day tomorrow, that low is going to push off further uh, offshore, but we are still in that onshore flow. Few chance uh, that we'll see some breaks in the cloud cover, mainly for central towards the Avalon, but generally looking at that periods of snow, especially in the higher elevations along the mountainous areas. We could see anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of snow tomorrow afternoon in some of these heavier uh, onshore squalls potentially. And then uh, gonna taper to flurries for coastal portions of Labrador, but you're still gonna pick up potentially a couple more centimeters of snow on the way tomorrow. So here's what uh, this takes us through to tomorrow morning and then through the day on Friday into Saturday morning. So you can see those areas in those higher elevations will likely pick up the majority of the snowfall. So here's a look at tomorrow's forecast sitting uh, around three degrees, so much cooler today for parts of the Avalon and those winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, either showers or flurries through the day. A uh, little bit more sunshine on the way as you head towards Terra Nova, Grand Falls, Windsor, you're still looking at that potential for either flurries or some showers tomorrow and then uh, periods of snow along the west coast. Your winds will be uh, westerlies 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Up through uh, Labrador, again, coastal flurries possible, hovering around the zero degree mark. As we head into Lab West, that's where that cool air is. Minus 12 will be your afternoon high for Lab City and your wind chills uh, significantly less than that. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll talk uh, a little bit ahead when I come back. And then we realized, okay, East Planet Labrador has our back. <laughs> 
A devastating fire didn't leave so much as a can of soup for this food bank. We're getting into the giving spirit with a look back at how a community came together. Well, it was a disaster that gripped the province, becoming one of the biggest news stories of 2019. Almost one year ago, the Community Food Sharing Association saw its St. John's warehouse destroyed by fire, along with every scrap of food inside. This holiday season, CBC is raising funds for local food banks with our Warm Hearts campaign. And tonight, we're looking back on the fire and the incredible response that followed. Here now, Zach Gowdy has that story. On the morning of January 30th, 2019, Egg Walters woke up to the news that his life's work was on fire. 
We have absolutely no food. We don't even have one can of soup now that we could, we could distribute. The Community Food Sharing Association was located in a warehouse on Topsail Road. Inside, food was stacked floor to ceiling, more than $300,000 worth, bound for the dozens of food banks around the province that the association supplies. But by dawn of that day, there was nothing left. I've been with community food sharing for 27 years, and it's the worst thing that ever happened to me in those 27 years. I mean, I, I shake now when I, when I get under stress, you know, and to say it was devastating and stressful would be an understatement. My stomach was right up my throat to see that and to know what was in the warehouse and to wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. I think I burst into tears immediately. <laughs> I was at work and a called. Wanda Hillier is the board chair at Community Food Sharing Association. And so the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh my, Tuesday ship day. This is like four days from then. So I'm thinking, hmm, how do you not have those doors open for a food bank that is out of food? Those food banks were wondering the same thing. The Single Parents Association is just one of the groups that depends on community food sharing to stock its shelves. So all of this food was picked up yesterday before the fire? Before the fire, yes it was. Wow. But you won't see, like this goes in, in two days, it's, got, you know, it's gone because we have so many families coming in. The fire was out, but the threat of thousands going hungry was hanging in the air. But just then, a different kind of spark flared up. It's important that we all rally together, get, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we take care of each other. All over the province, people sprang into action, looking to help out in ways big and small. At the St. John's Farmer's Market, vendors donated their proceeds. I'm in the food business, you could say, and what better use of my resources than to help other people eat. Public libraries accepted food donations in place of fines for overdue books. So already it's starting to gain a lot of traction. As the story grew, so did the donations. The corporate community broke out the big checks, tens of thousands of dollars at a time. Then the biggest donation of all, the keys to a new warehouse provided rent free by the provincial government. Then we realized, okay, we find Labrador has our back. <laughs> you know, you've got Food Banks Canada calling, how many tractor trailer loads can you take? We've got companies calling that are not even in Newfoundland saying, we've got food, how much do you want? To the point where we were delaying trucks because we couldn't accommodate everything that was coming in. Just one week after the fire, after being left without a single can of soup, the Community Food Sharing Association was up and running again. The lost food more than made up for. The work of local food banks and the people behind them doesn't get celebrated every day. But in those hectic days of early 2019, people in this province showed how much that work means and how grateful they are. I think what it did, it, it reawakened the, the generosity, the generous spirit of the Newfoundlanders you know, throughout the whole province and on the mainland as well. All we had to do was just tell the story. We didn't say we want this, we want that, we want something else. All we did was said, this is what happened, and we kept the faith. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. It's Christmas time in St. John's. You're coming to the mall to get your Christmas gifts. Why not give a gift to the whole community? CBC's Feed at L Day is Thursday, December 12th. We'll have live music from Damien Follett and other great artists. CBC personalities will be here to wrap your Christmas gifts. And best of all, we're raising funds for your local food bank. Make sure no one in this province goes hungry this Christmas. And on Thursday, December 12th, we'll make sure everyone at the Avalon Mall stays merry. Well, as you can see, I'm filling in for Anthony tonight because he's hosting an annual Christmas fundraiser in St. John. So let's check in with him now to hear more about the Festival of Trees. Anthony. Yeah, well, Carolyn, you're looking at a uh, jersey by Washington Capitals player Alexander Ovechkin, a signed jersey. People are bidding on that already at this fantastic event, Festival of Trees. This is the 24th year this has run. We're here live at the Delta, and I'm joined by the chair of this event, Heather McKinnon. So Heather, what's the whole event about? It's about providing uh, funds for running uh, 
the Canadian Cancer Society and all the services they provide to people living with cancer. That could be support groups, it could be wigs that they give out for free. Uh, it, could they also um, give out prostheses and of course they run Daffodil Place providing a home away from home for people outside the city. Well, let's talk about that. Obviously, cancer is something that has, you know, touches most of us. You probably know somebody in your direct family or your extended family or somebody who's dealt with cancer. Certainly, in my case, is true, and I know that you know about this personally, and we're going to get into that. But it's, it's a disease that really is unfair to attack so many different people. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what's your sense of the benefit of this kind of fundraiser? Well, it's necessary for the operating funds for the Canadian Cancer Society because they also provide a 1-800 information line. They have a support line. They also have a driving service. Uh, all of these funds helps them operate through the air, and it's cri these are critical funds for them. I guess the other thing is that there are, there are many Newfoundlanders, of course, Newfoundlanders, Labradorians. If you don't live in St. John's, you might have to come to St. John's for your treatment, and that's where Daffodil Place comes in. And one of the things about this fundraiser, and I'm the MC which I'm happy to do, uh, the money stays in our province, and that's that's a big selling point of this, right? Th that is correct. The money does stay in this province, and we're actually happy that, um, as a committee, we get to request where our money goes, and last year, uh, some of our money went to a really new, a promising new research program being undertaken by Newfoundlanders, and uh, you know, treating cancer is one thing, but we're also inter interested in prevention. All right, and I guess to close things off, Daffodil Place, one of the beneficiaries of this fundraiser, mm -hmm. there are many people who don't have the support because they live on the Northern Peninsula, Correct. the big land, and when they come here, Daffodil Place does what? It provides, them, uh, it provides them a home for them to stay in, it provides meals, it provides supports. Uh, there's a driving program to get them back and forth to their appointments, and of course, as you know, it's fairly close to the Health Sciences Centre, but it provides a sense of community for them in order to heal. Heather McKinnon, thank you very much. Thank I know it's going to be a great night. I've got lots to say tonight, so thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that's Heather McKinnon. Now, you see all the beautiful trees behind me here? Well, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, they've got a fantastic tree lighting. Yeah, here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, there's an ambulance uh, behind me on one side, and it's being packed full of uh, food items for the food bank. And behind me on the other side, there's a Christmas tree, and that's about to get a lot more colorful in just a few minutes from, from now. Uh, more on that coming up.
Now to a story of perseverance and how one moment can change your life. We spent time over the last week or so telling you about an international sledge hockey championship in paradise. It's not your regular game of ice hockey. These guys have been through some of the most trying circumstances. Some have even come close to death. One of the players in paradise for the international tournament is Zachary Lavin. He grew up in the same town in Ontario as here and now's Meg Roberts, and she remembers when life changed for him. This week, she reunited with the star athlete. I remember Zach Lavin as a kid running around the playground at our tiny rural grade school. He always had a big smile on his face, lots of energy. He wasn't very big. We went our separate ways as we grew up, and then about four years ago, Zach went missing in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta. He went out for a winter hike, intrigued by something we didn't see growing up in flat farm country in Essex, Ontario. I still remember the headlines. So I was hiking, got disorientated, and then for three days, I was basically just trying to find my way back to where it started. When Zach was finally found, he was still wandering, hallucinating, drinking snow and fearful for the pain he wasn't feeling in his legs. The frostbite so severe, doctors amputated both his legs almost up to his knees. She definitely demands text before But Zach after, persevered you know. and now he's in Newfoundland for one of the biggest sledge hockey tournaments of the year. Sitting down with him in St. John's all these years later, the smile is the same. I finally get to ask him face to face how he made it through those three grueling days. I just kept pushing through the pain and just wanted to see my family again. Were there moments where you're like, I might not come out of this? Most definitely, yeah. I remember sitting down at one point, getting pretty emotional, thinking that this could might be the end. Luckily it wasn't. It wasn't the end, but rather a new beginning. My name is Zach Lavin and I am a Canadian national sledge hockey player. How long afterwards did you start playing sledge hockey? It was just after the summer, so I, I spent uh, a few months in hospital, two months in uh, inpatient rehab, learning how to use prosthetics. And then actually the first day out of that, I met an uh, amputee in the gym named Chris Strand, and he was a jack dude and he you know, made the prosthetic look pretty good. So he brought me out to the rink and started trying out sledge hockey. Love it! Chance for him! Oh! Oh. Only a year later, Zach landed himself a spot on the national sledge hockey team. New legs, new friends, new goals. I love the physicality and I love the brotherhood aspect. Every guy on my team has been through, you know, some pretty crazy things. And we use that to fuel for our games. Although Zach says life still has its ups and downs, he wouldn't go back to the life he lived before that winter day in 2016. I'm content because without my accident, I wouldn't be the person I am and I wouldn't have learned the lessons I have. And without those, I think I'd be living a different life. But this one's pretty good. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Paradise. Great story. Well, now we're going to head to Happy Valley Goose Bay where people are getting into the Christmas spirit. The town's tree will light up any minute now and they're collecting donations for the food bank. Here and now's Jacob Barker. You can see he's live tonight. Hi, Jacob. Hello, uh, yeah, this is the uh, Christmas tree lighting here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and I'm told that maybe in the next couple of minutes it's gonna be lighting on, uh, lighting up, um, but while we wait for that to happen, I have Mayor Wally Anderson standing right beside me uh, to tell me about this event tonight. So there's a couple of causes going along with this, hey? Yes, there is. Uh, we're having our uh, annual Christmas tree lighting uh, where we uh, honor our troops. Uh, you know, uh, many of them are overseas. Uh, protecting children and little children that can go out and uh, have a, uh, a night like we're having here. And there we go. Oh, there it is. There's the Christmas tree. So I guess that makes it officially Christmas here in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And, uh, uh, on behalf of all the residents in Happy Valley Goose Bay, we want to wish the uh, people in the rest of the province uh, a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And unfortunately, you don't have the Christmas weather like we do. <laughs> What does it mean? What does it mean Christmas here in Happy Valley Goose Bay? What's this time of year all about? It means uh, families getting together, you know, uh, uh, Labrador is sort of uh, isolated and we got uh, people coming home for Christmas. Uh, other people are traveling out and uh, I know myself I'll be going to Edmonton to visit our little granddaughter. And uh, but most important of all is the time when people get together 
to take Christmas for what it really is, uh, a time to get together uh, for what Christmas really is and to share the gift of giving and remember those we've lost uh, over the past year. And, and I understand there's a big yellow ribbon that's going to go up on the tree. Can you tell me a little bit about why that's happening? Well, our troops are overseas and as I said, many of them are over there. They're, they're, they're protecting innocent uh, men and women and children who can't go out to have a Christmas tree like they're away from their homes, uh, from their families. So we thought we would do a little extra special this year and we would, uh, we would have this big uh, ribbon and uh, show our appreciation for all they do for us. And I guess the basis here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, it's always been a big part of the community too, hey? It's, uh, it's been, in, well actually, you know, if you look at the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay, it was built because of uh, the base. And we've always had a big military presence, uh, a big employment, but they're like a family. Uh, uh, when, uh, when we need them, they always respond. At Christmas time, we get together, and this is our way of the yellow ribbon uh, uh, lighting up the Christmas tree to show our appreciation to the first responders, Canadian Forces, for all they do. And there's the Christmas carols kicking in now. So I guess this is Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mayor Wally. Anderson. And same to you, and, and thank you to CBC for <laughs> covering this night. And uh, again, to everybody else in the rest of the province, envy of a real Christmas weather. Okay, Merry Christmas everybody, Merry Christmas Carolyn. That's actually the CBC uh, choir that's taken over on the stage there, so I'm gonna go up and join them. Great, <laughs> thanks Jacob. It looks like a beautiful evening, and uh, yeah, have a great time out there. Welcome back. And right before the break, we checked in with Jacob Barker in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And what a beautiful evening. It looked so Christmassy with all that light snow coming lightly down. falling snow. <laughs> That's, I think, one of my favorite things is when it's lightly falling snow. Yeah, rather <laughs> better than like sideways snow. <laughs> <laughs> no wind. Yeah, exactly. So we're looking ahead now to the long range and some more <laughs> nasty weather. We were just saying during the break that we've had like this this uh, rhythm going with all of these systems going through. It's like rinse and repeat. Literally. Yeah. And it's been taking essentially the same track uh, and that's because of the jet stream. So oh, hang on one second. I'm just getting a little something in my ear. I think we're going to just look up 
uh, we're gonna check in. Oh, see, there's that lightning falling too. Oh, nice. Oh, they are CBC staff actually singing some carolers, uh, singing some carols rather for uh, the crowd up there at the tree lighting ceremony. I love that hat. <laughs> Good crew there. Wow, that's a big tree. I guess there are a lot of big trees in Happy Valley East. <laughs> Beautifully lit there. That's awesome. Now that doesn't get you into the holiday spirit. I don't know what that oh. <laughs> Great so job. So great. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we're looking ahead. So. Yeah, so just before that, we were talking about how uh, it's been one system after another, mm -hmm. and uh, there is another one on the way for Saturday. We'll take a look at uh, what the future tracker is showing. So we are going to see that onshore snow continue along the west coast and then up through parts of Labrador as well. But as we head through the day on Saturday, there's that next system. Now, again, like over the past week or, so, or more than a week, really two or three weeks, uh, we've been seeing these systems roll through and it's really dependent on the temperatures, whether we see rain or snow on the Avalon. So this is what it's showing right now. This model particularly is pointing at snow first and then uh, potentially changing over to rain. Then we get back into that onshore flow overnight into Sunday morning. Here's those temperatures though. If we're hovering around the uh, zero degree mark or just a little bit above, that will more than likely be a transition of either rain or snow. But again, we're going to have to keep our eye on that one uh, over the next couple of days. Below zero temperatures for the rest of the island, looking at uh, snow through the day on Sunday or on Saturday rather, and then hanging on to those cool temperatures up through Lab City. Minus 14 will be your afternoon high and then Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at flurries as well and minus six. Now looking ahead uh, through the day on Saturday, again, going to stay with that onshore flow potential for some flurries, coastal areas as well as the northeast coast. And then the south coast of the island will see that potential for some snow as well with some clearing skies through parts of central Labrador. Then the next system rolls in for Monday. This one looks like it'll be snow as well. And then as we head into Tuesday, this is when the major system moves in. This one is going to be uh, a big push of warm air as well and then some windy conditions. So we're looking at some rain heavy at times for most of the island. Going to even see that for parts of southeastern Labrador and that will continue uh, really into Wednesday. So this one's going to stick around as we see more rain move in. So we're going to drop in temperatures as we head through the next couple of days below zero by Sunday and then that big push of warm air will move in up on Tuesday overnight. That's why I have those temperatures there. 12 degrees it looks like for uh, the overnight Tuesday into Wednesday. So certainly looking at that big push of warm air uh, for central Newfoundland as well. Likely not going to reach the double digits. At least it doesn't look like that right now. Certainly have a couple of days to figure that out. And then for western Newfoundland, uh, potential for a few peaks of sun on Sunday and then back into that rain for both Monday and Tuesday. Now for eastern Labrador, your temperatures are going to dip into the double digits by Sunday, minus 10, and then jump a little bit uh, on Monday back up to the mid minus single digits with snow returning on Tuesday. And then we've got uh, western Labrador looking at about minus 12 tomorrow, and then you're going to stay in those double digits through Sunday. And then Monday, we're looking at a temperature near minus 7 and minus 10 on Tuesday with that snow sticking around. Thanks, Ashley. Well, to national news now, there is a new Speaker of the House of Commons. Ontario Liberal MP Anthony Rhoda was elected to the chair today by fellow MPs. Biggest honour of my political career, being here chosen as Speaker. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à vous tous. As is the tradition, Rhoda was dragged to the chair by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and leader of the opposition, Andrew Scheer. Rhoda thanked his colleagues and family. He also paid tribute to the other four candidates, including the most recent speaker, Jeff Regan. Rhoda is the first person of Italian descent in the role and gave part of his acceptance speech in Italian. That new job also comes with an $80,000 pay bump and apartment and an official residence. Well, if you use this trail, you might know where this is. Take a look at this beautiful shot. 
I'll tell you where this is to when we come back. Welcome back everyone. Well, a light festival in Lyon, France is incorporating climate change into its annual Christmas tradition. Take a look. Yeah, the event includes 65 installations celebrating the natural world. The goal is to raise awareness of environmental issues. And designers from around the world create installations for this high profile event and about a million people come to check it out each year. Wow. That's so good. It reminds me of uh, Parliament. They do that on Parliament. Oh, yeah, right. That's incredible. It's so beautiful. They look like a starfish in, in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Yeah. Well, something else beautiful we have mm -hmm. to look at right now. Take a look at this photo. So you have any idea where that is? Uh, I feel like I should. <laughs> I really do. It is actually a uh, part of the Father Troy oh. Trail, and it's actually looking south. Okay. So if you use that trail a lot, I'm sure you know exactly where that is. Yeah. Beautiful shot Great there. Thank shot. you. Yeah, Terrence uh, or Leary sent us that wonderful photo. And uh, if you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and we'll try and get them on the show. All right. What a difference in the uh, weather across the <laughs> island. <laughs> it's amazing to compare what's happening in St. John's right now, particularly this afternoon where it felt like spring. 10 degrees. Compared to Happy Valley Goose Bay right now, it's, it's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah, big province. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> little province, but big, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and more weather on the way on Saturday mm -hmm. too, so we'll see how that all plays out. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. Anthony, we'll be back here tomorrow night. Good night.